Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another one of our videos on our brand new Riley Real Estate Ventures YouTube channel. We have a very special guest today. We have Shane, who is our Director of Finance. Welcome, Shane. Brendan, happy to be here. Yep. Um, okay, so, you know, just wanted to bring you um, bring you on board with regards to, um, you know, what we're seeing in the real estate market uh, with regards to um, rents and cap rates um, and where where you see our, our current projects and the, and the values in them moving forward. Um, so I have a few questions for you. I'll just jump straight in. Question number one would be, um, how has COVID-19 affected the real estate market since since the um, pandemic hit back in February, March time? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, what we've been seeing in the real estate market right now is almost a general pause in things, um, a pause in real estate transactions, a pause on any decreases or increases in prices. Uh, generally, everyone's just on hold right now um, in a holding pattern, waiting to see what everyone will do. Um, there's there's several sectors within the real estate industry. Obviously, there's single family homes. There's the commercial real estate market, which is comprised of industrial, commercial, um, retail, as well as uh, multifamily residential. Um, without a doubt, some of those sectors have been harder hit than others. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of transactions, it's on pause. In terms of valuations, rents, um, also somewhat, but definitely in the retail side, uh, we're, we're gonna see more of an impact than anything else. Um, as, as we all know, retail has effectively been shut down for the past two, three months. Uh, it's not the most resilient in terms of COVID-19. However, on the flip side, um, multifamily residential, which is our apartment buildings, there hasn't been too much of a, an effect right now in terms of valuations and rents. Um, as it turns out, everyone has actually been paying rents. I think uh, I read somewhere in the high 90 percentages of all uh, all apartment buildings have seen rent collection come in uh, as normal so far. Um, so in terms of real estate investment in the real estate market, that's a really good sign. Um, it shows that probably out of all sectors in general, multifamily apartment buildings are going to be the least affected, if affected at all. Right. Um, more specifically, how has this pandemic affected our projects that we have on the go currently from a finance standpoint? So from a finance standpoint, we're quite, quite all right. Um, we've always built very, very large contingencies of timelines into our budgets, into our projects. This means that projects go on at least five to six months longer than we were expecting. And that would just be our baseline. So in terms of actually shutting down for three months, it's not much of an effect. In fact, during this time, there wasn't much happening in terms of projects moving forward with construction or anything that it's really has been affected by COVID-19. This is more of a time when we were planning with architects, planning with engineers, developing plans which hasn't really stopped us uh, from COVID-19. So that's good. Um, the one, one project that we did have under construction, yes, has been slowed down just because work crews were unable to get in there. But as I mentioned before, um, when we build in timelines, uh, contingencies in our timelines, we, we account for at least six months of overruns. So shutting down for two months, it, it's not a big deal. And as we were seeing anyways with um, our projects, construction has been moving significantly faster than we had anticipated already. So so really we uh, we won't be affected significantly at all. Right, so uh, construction was moving significantly fa faster pre-COVID-19. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned, uh, my next question is, what contingencies do we use? Do we build into our performers? You mentioned one, which was timelines. Can you name a few others, please? Sure. So when I build out the budgets for our projects originally, so when we're just about to acquire them, I'm extremely conservative with all of our uh, with all of our budgets and timelines. Um, what that means is basically for the total cost of every single project, I add in 5% of the total budget, which includes the land purchase price, the hard costs, which is the construction costs, all the soft costs, which is like architects and engineers. Um, I add 5% of the entire budget on as a contingency. And that usually works out to about 250, 
that is just there as a contingency. Um, the second contingency I usually build in is, as I mentioned before, a timeline. So if we're expecting um, at least one year from start to finish, I base our budget on a year and a half, which means six extra months of paying interest on our projects. Um, yeah. So that is built in right from the start. That's We know we can afford at least one year and six months for these projects to, to finish, even though we're expecting one year. Um, when I stress test the final valuations of the building, I always use current rents minus 10%. Um, and by doing that, I just look in the area, I look at similar quality products of, um, of what will be our final final uh, final product. Yeah. So something along similar quality, sometimes I even look a little under our quality just to be a bit more conservative. I take 10% off of those rents and then that's what I base our baseline rents on. And then through those rents, I project a valuation on the project. So at least two ways that I'm strongly, strongly conservative of uh, underwriting these projects. Right, yep, makes sense. Um, moving forward, what cap rates can we expect to see with our lenders and with banks that they're going to be using uh, to value future buildings? It's a good question. So I think uh, first it's crucial to explain what capitalization or cap rates are. Um, so basically cap rates uh, are the name given to something if uh, someone, were to come in, someone were to come in and purchase a building for a certain amount of money, they want for pure cash, they want to see what return they would get in that building at the end of the day. If they had paid 100% cash, the net income from that building. So almost think of it as if you're investing in a bond, I'll say, or a stock. If you give a million dollars for a bond, are you going to make 1%, 2%, 3%? Um, so that's what cap rates are, basically. It's the net return as a percentage at the end of the year if you were to pay pure cash for a building. So cap rates generally right now have been hovering around high threes, so 3.85 to 4.25, which means if someone paid all cash for a building, that is the percentage they would get back at the end of the year. Um, now, basically when cap rates go up, building values decrease. When, building, when cap rates go down, building values increase since people are willing to accept a lower return. Um, in this market, we've been seeing, or I mean, really in the real estate market in general, you always see cap rates or capitalization rates chase, chase bond rates. And right now we're seeing bond rates go down, um, as well as prime from Bank of Canada. So what does that mean for cap rates? It could mean they'll go down. Um, if anything, I do see them staying stable and for our buildings, really we're expecting around a 4% cap rate. So that's good for us. That means basically what we, how we've been valuing our buildings will continue on. Great, good, um, good answer. Um, so there's a lot of question around rents. Do we see rents staying the same? Do we see, see them dipping? Do we see them jumping back up over a certain period of time? Um, how do you think rents will be affected, <laughs> in your opinion, um, by this pandemic? So to understand what will happen in rents in the future, we kind of have to understand what, will what was happening with rents in the past. Um, rents have been rising at a phenomenally fast rate in Toronto over the past, I'd say, 10 years. This was really due to a supply and demand issue. There were just far more people coming into Toronto than we were building rental apartments. Um, as we know, the single family home market in Toronto has exploded. It's very, very cost prohibitive for people to, to buy homes these days. So they're looking to rents. Um, so the trend apartments, it's creating a huge demand issue and there was just not enough apartments being built in Toronto. Um, right now with, uh, with COVID-19, it's also going to put a cap on supply. Um, a lot of projects are hesitant to start right now. So we're going to see a huge dip in the number of apartments coming in line in the future in probably six months to one year. That's going to create another supply issue. Um, demand, however, also may or may not drop off uh, depending on how immigration goes after the COVID-19 crisis is over. Personally, I don't see it dropping off um, due to Canada's commitment of bringing in uh, a large, large, large number of immigration over the next few years. Um, even if immigration and demand does dip slightly, the supply side has also dipped slightly for apartments. So I really don't see any huge effect in rent overall. 
if anything, there could be a slight, slight correction in rent. We'll see a drop, maybe two to three percent. But after COVID nineteen, I think there's going to be a lot of pent up, uh, pent up demand for people moving, and we're going to recover very, very fast. If there's any, rec- if if we even need to recover, um, mm-hmm. I don't see any huge drop in rents whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Right. And to apply that specifically to our Riley Real Estate Ventures projects, we're running numbers, our pro formas, uh, minus 10% of the current market rent. So yep. we're well within, that, well within that bracket, so to speak. Yeah, well um, within. I also mentioned that um, during the last financial crisis in 2008, we really only saw rents drop 2 to 3% in Toronto. Uh, and that was a significant financial crisis uh, yeah. that affected the entire world so if we made it through that with only small small price drops then i mean we're pretty safe now right yep um and my last question is uh during times of crisis or during uh, a recession what's the asset class that you think holds the strongest and why so typically in the past um Gold has done extremely, extremely well during times of crisis and recession, uh, primarily because people like tangible assets. They like hard goods. Um, during times of crisis, they don't want to see something disappear overnight where stocks uh, stocks can dry up. Um, they can go from, they can lose a significant amount of their value and people have no tangible assets those, that those uh, stocks are associated with. Um, other tangible assets, Real estate, Um, they know that even if in the worst case scenario that prices have dropped in real estate, there's still an asset there at the end of the day that they can go and see. Um, And right now it's even more so. People are really looking for resilient asset classes now. Uh, We've seen in the past few months, gold has went up in price. Uh, Real estate, uh, multifamily real estate, things that are resilient, they haven't really dropped in price yet. Um, People like to see tangible assets and real estate is one of those. Great. Shane, thank you much for your time. Appreciate it. Um, This is Brendan from Riley Real Estate Ventures signing off. Stay tuned for more YouTube videos coming soon. Remember, dream, believe, create, succeed. Bye for now.